ancient history. Okay, good afternoon. Hello, my name is Mary Ray and I would like to welcome you to the Technical Libraries Have I Got a Story for You. Our guest storyteller today has agreed to share just a small portion of his many experiences here at China Lake. In his 35 plus years of employment, he has received several prestigious awards, including the Meritorious Civilian Service Award. These stories today will focus on the importance of the technology transfer process here at China Lake and specifically the development of the standard anti-radiation missile and the active optical target detecting device that was made for that missile. Please join me in welcoming Tom Loftus. Thank you. Thank you. Can I sit in the chair? Yep. This looks so neat. <laughs> well, first of all, let me say thanks officially to the, all the libra library staff for inviting me. Um, I had not actually attended a story time before, but I did take advantage of some of the recordings that uh, I'll refer to later, now that I know something about them. Uh, yes, the topic will be really one of uh, how transitions occur, technology transitions into fleet systems. And this has been an object of um, interest to me for some time, of course. Uh, why would you study transition technologies? Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I think um, working as uh, technology planning and investment strategy, uh, one of the key criteria for success has always been uh, transitioning our product, the product of the S&T, uh, into fleet systems. That very important to our sponsors and important to the science and engineers who actually make all this stuff happen. And so we would study occasionally when opportunity presented itself how, what the dynamics were for developing the technology and getting it applied. It helped in building lessons learned and of course uh, changing our own processes to try to affect those things positively that we could affect. Much of this process is beyond Indy one organization's control, as I'll try to make clear in the example. <coughs> um, and we try to identify sort of what the key elements were of all of the stories, you know, try to take some generalizations out. And we will talk about the, uh, each of these technologies uh, were started and developed with an application in mind a priority need that existed. And uh, then the technologies were taken to a level of maturity so that they could actually be assessed for uh, applications when that time came up. And finally, whether it's happenstance or whether it's blind luck or whether you can kind of plan when a acquisition system is going to be interested in that kind of technology and for that kind of purpose. And we'll try to go through this example uh, considering all of those different aspects. Um, this topic really spins off from one of the very earliest uh, story times. I don't know how many people were actually here for Bob Huntley's discussion. Uh, I found it very interesting and, and for those of you who haven't seen it, they do have a uh, recording of it that is I would highly recommend. He gave a very good description of not only his personal experiences as a pilot during the Vietnam conflict period and as an organization uh, called the Wild Weasels were being established and operating. Their primary function was to escort attack aircraft, uh, in, particularly in North Vietnam where they had a substantial amount of anti-aircraft uh, fire both artillery, which uh, uh, really set the limit as to how an attack aircraft could come in, how low it could come in. And for higher elevations, uh, the threat was the surface-to-air missile, SA-2 uh, variety, uh, typically. And he talked, Bob talked about um, the capabilities that were brought to bear by the China Lake developed Shrike missile. Uh, the Shrike missile was uh, ingenious in, in, in its uh, 
use of existing systems based on the Sparrow kind of missile size, and but incorporated a um, anti-radiation homing seeker for the first time. And uh, I was really impressed with his description of the tactics that were developed in order to employ that weapon to its best effect. Well, now I'll talk a little bit about from the Navy perspective. Uh, during that period of time, I happened to be assigned to an A-4 squadron out of Lemoore and uh, did a cruise on the USS Coral Sea. And so just to set that stage, uh, this illustration, I don't know if you can see it, I stole from Google to il illustrate the, uh, the Vietnam coast, North Vietnam uh, at the time. And uh, it was, if you recall, um, in August of 1964 when the sort of infamous Gulf of Tonkin incidents occurred. And after that, uh, the resolution was passed to uh, move our attacks into the North Vietnamese region. And that's when they identified somewhere about in here Point Yankee, which was where the staging area was for the fleet for, to launch the uh, aircraft raids uh, from the carriers. My home at the time, um, this was taken in 1962, so it's a little bit earlier, but it is interesting. You can't not see it here. By the way, I do have some copies of these photos so you can actually see a little bit closer up uh, after the time, or maybe you might have some questions. If you could see it real well, <laughs> you would identify these kinds of aircraft. In the attack case, uh, the A-4 squadrons had a couple of squadrons there. Uh, the AD or SPAD is what we used to call it, uh, rotary uh, engine attack. And the whale or the A3 that had a number of uh, functions, but of course provided uh, fuel, refueling, uh, because this was about a 300 mile trip. Um, the F8, F4, the F8 was our principal uh, air combat uh, aircraft. Uh, then the E2 and COD and UH-1, all of those are identifiable on this picture if you could see it, and there's a whole row of the ADs. Okay, well, I've, I've mentioned the AD a couple of times. For those of you who may not know, let, can you take me to the next chart, please? If you haven't been to the museum lately, um, you will find some changes. As of last weekend, <laughs> We finally finished work on this AD. This was a, uh, I call it a restoration process that, that started a couple of years ago. Uh, it's not restored to, to flying, of course, but it is a nice display. Um, and this is the kind of aircraft uh, that was a real workhorse as far as carrying bombs from the carrier. It sits next to the fancied up Hornet 1. Yeah. Invite your going over and taking a look at it. Uh, back to that other chart, though, uh, I guess my point, other than to make a sly introduction for the aircraft, let's go to the next slide, uh, was to give you some sense of the threat, you know, what, what these SA-2s might do. Uh, this photo is actually looking up at the uh, underside of the A-4 wing. Pilot here. Um, was on a mission, North Vietnam, and was actually struck by an SA-2. It went right through the wing, did not fuse. The SA, uh, to my understanding, was uh, at that time pretty well uh, radar guided, that is command guided from the ground centers, and actually had a command detonation mode. So you, you could, I don't know why this one didn't detonate. Maybe they were off that day. Maybe it was affected by some of the equipment that the uh, wild weasel folks had and others. Uh, but nonetheless, it went right through. But the pilot was able to um, regain control, uh, go feet wet um, over the seas where he could t attach to a tanker and uh, fly it right back and landed on the carrier. Very impressive job. Unfortunately, I don't remember the pilot's name. It was our XO. I think actually he was one of the replacement pilots. We lost a couple during that cruise. Kind of interesting. We left San Francisco with the 
full contingent of aircraft, A4, 13 aircraft. Over the 11 months, we lost 12. And Hetsui had a number of replacements. Uh, some were just hangar queens we stole parts off of. But, uh, but I think he joined us a little bit later after the cruise book was actually documented, so I didn't have his name. I'm sorry. This kid over here is fresh off the farm. He looks bewildered, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, next one, please. And this is the top. Wow. Uh, you know, I was a little short at the time, but I could actually stick my head and shoulders through the, the wing of the A4. So I, I use this as an illustration that uh, they were taking a lot of fire. Um, SA-2, unfortunately, was a pretty, pretty lethal weapon. Um, and we needed to come up with something. Um, this was the, the, the genesis, uh, the, the driver for certainly the strike missile. And it helped a great deal. Wasn't quite complete. Next. This actually shows uh, a strike on a Channel Lake um, A4. It was actually carried mostly by A6s. I don't remember actually loading strike. Uh, of course, it would have been there a little bit after I left anyway, probably. But the strike was very successful and probably would be the topic of a very nice story time if we can entice some knowledgeable folks into sharing that with us. Um, in service from 65, so I probably might have overlapped the last part all the way through 92. Some people tell me that uh, there might still be strike or maybe uh, standard arm um, international systems, but they're both retired now from the, na from the uh, U.S. forces. The strike produced quite a few, but it had some issues with regard to uh, the rocket motor size. The sparrow size rocket didn't carry it quite as far as they wanted had some uh, limited guidance capabilities, and uh, there were some questions about lethality. And so uh, people started talking about a joint system, of course, a Air Force uh, Navy joint weapon instead of the Channel Lake developed strike. And they let the Navy uh, be the lead of the contract, and so the Navy said, you want a bigger rocket motor, I want one of these. And this is a standard, motor, uh, standard missile uh, surface launch. It's the Tartar kind of uh, family. And they actually released a contract to GD Pomona at the time. And uh, they said, I want to go to production in three years. No development at all required for this. You just have to put lug nuts on this missile and, and make it suitable for aircraft launch. Oh, and by the way, we'll give you a Navy-designed uh, seeker. You know, so just take this right seeker, bolt it on here, and make it fly. Sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? <laughs> and Gigi said, OK, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> we'll do that. And so they started off um, a three-year program, which uh, after about two and a half, or maybe two and three quarters years, <laughs> they uh, admitted that they had some fusing problems. So anyway, what we have is the, the problem area that is still in the uh, defense from the standard arm or, or the uh, SA-2. We have an acquisition program that says, hey, we're in trouble. And if we don't solve this fusing problem, as it turns out to be the, the issue was taking the Shrike-designed RF system and trying to mold it into this larger missile with a different configuration. and Contractors actually, they actually went to two different subcontractors trying to solve the problem and finally admitted in 1969 that we're not going to be able to do this. And so, better late than ever, they probably called the Tiger team. Maybe you remember Matt better than I do. Uh, but I, I get all my information, by the way, from Joe McKenzie, who was our principal author here. And uh, he, he describes a team that was brought together to take a look at what the issues were, see what could be done. And Joe says, I think I can solve this problem. And so now we'll talk a little bit about <coughs> what the state of the technology was, um, not so much from the RF system of point of view. Um, first of all, uh, I need to go to a different kind of a system. Um, this happens to be right about the time when uh, um, lethality got to be 
uh, an issue for air combat with Sidewinder. The, uh, we had a family of capabilities, B, C, and D, uh, that were, another aside, I just read uh, this morning, uh, I was looking at the Raytheon history page for the Sidewinder, and uh, they made the comment that the first recorded kill, air-to-air -air combat, uh, with a guided missile was the Sidewinder 1A. Um, that was in 1958. Uh, actually launched by Taiwanese uh, pilots against the Chinese MiG-15, this aircraft. If you could see the, I, I, I apologize for the quality of the art, but what you can tell here is there is a target aircraft, probably a drone for a test, uh, going this way, and a missile coming up this way, and you can see the leading edge of the swept wings here, and the blast is actually a little bit late. Uh, and that was an illustration of the fusing kind of issue for Sidewinder, you know, the uh, um, usually uh, uh, an infrared kind of fuse. And um, it had a relatively low resolution at the time. And so there were possibilities for when the, when the vector between the missile and the aircraft was such that you could not get a very reliable uh, time delay, fixed time delay to release uh, the warhead. And that problem needed to be addressed uh, in about the uh, early 60s. And we can go to the next, next chart. Uh, so, so 58, this is the first kill from the Sidewinder they, they recorded. In about 55, uh, we had some folks uh, that were actually transferred up from Corona, which is another interesting little sidelight. Um, maybe that's a precursor to the BRAC, uh, you know. Uh, if, and I'll tell you, if we have another BRAC that is as successful as the move to Corona was for Channel Lake, we will be very happy. Uh, there were some very bright people working there in fusing. And, uh, I'm going to quote a lot of Roy Nichols' work. I think he was a visionary in the active optical targeting uh, area. Um, and he had some great people, he had, uh, the ability to hire some very good people. And uh, certainly Joe McKenzie was part of that group and instrumental in the implementation of, well, the creation and implementation of the designs. Um, extraordinary engineer. Um, and those are the folks who actually made this possible. What happened was uh, in 1955 or thereabouts, um, Wayne can help, help me with this, this uh, history process probably, uh, the first LED was actually reported in a laboratory. Uh, about 10 years later, the first laser semiconductor device was reported. Well, even during this time, um, Roy Nichols was thinking, wow, if we could have a semiconductor source, optical source, that we could control, and then match that with the kinds of sensitive uh, photodiodes and preamplifiers that Joe McKenzie could come up with, hybridize them into a small cost-effective system, match it with some plastic optics so that we could control those beams. All of those things uh, he had in his mind. Uh, of course, it took a while before actual devices were, were available. About five years later, we could get some room temperature uh, LEDs. And by that time, he had already started the process of uh, bidding for, selling, however you get science and technology programs at that time. But he, was, he made a proposal in the early 60s and got a 6-2 program right about here that could actually put these together in feasibility demonstration models. And it took a while to compile all the techniques. Um, and he actually went for two different development models. One was the air-to-air -air, uh, fusing model that uh, he, we, we uh, needed for the Sidewinder kinds of issues. And he also started one that was an electro-optic um, altimeter fuse. Um, didn't know where that was going to go at the time, but turns out that's the one we want to talk about. 
Um, and so by the late 60s, he actually had development models. He, and by the way, that was the same time that they were moving to China Lake. <laughs> and so he brought his model up uh, for the air-to-air -air, uh, encounter, and we did fly over, we did, they did fly over tests, um, really demonstrating its capability. And then ultimately, he actually compiled one, or built one up for the uh, laser diode. It was actually a stack of semiconductor lasers uh, that were coupled together to provide the, the full power that he needed for these systems. Okay, so now what I want to do is go back to, okay, so what was standard ARM program doing? Well, that was about in here when they said go or no go. If you don't have a solution to this fusing problem, we're going to shut it down. They actually uh, awarded the contract, I think, in about six, 1966. Uh, it, by 69, they said go or no go. And, uh, and that's when the Channel Lake team said, yeah, we can solve this problem for you. And the real impressive part of the story, I believe, is what happened in the next 18 months. So they didn't have much time. Fortunately, they had a high priority in the system. So in 18 months, what the Channel Lake team did was put together prototype units, conduct full testing on those units, including two launches in White Sounds. Also, they released a, what was called a production engineering task at Philco Ford, Ford Aerospace, uh, no, part of Raytheon, I guess, I don't know. Um, and they, s they were given a contract to deliver 35 working units and all test equipment that would be required for them, and you can do it in four months. Uh, all, all from the engineering drawings that Channel Lake provided. They did it. I think that's incredible. Six months later, they released a co production contract to Martin Marietta. Six months. Within two years, they went from a feasibility demonstration model to production. Extraordinary people with and what you can be done what can be done with um, with the right priority and the right talent and the technology that you is very fresh. Next chart please. Oh I don't want to talk about this one. <laughs> uh, this well, I'm sorry, it's misplaced, but uh, to tell you what it was, this, this is an interesting picture of the, the strike, the uh, st standard arm, and then the harm, which is our current capability in this family. Um, actually, it's a little bit out of scale, probably drawn recently by the harm folks, but this was the biggest, <laughs> this was the big missile, you know, it was, it was on the order, uh, better than a foot in diameter. Uh, the harm is a little bit smaller, but it did take the best out of both aspects uh, of the earlier models. The, let's see if there's another one there. That, in case you're curious about this, what, no, that's not right either. My goodness, we got through, um, okay. I apologize. I, I think we got the wrong uh, oh. setup, but that's all right. Uh, let, me, let me just hold it here. Okay. Uh, so the standard arm went into production. Um, actually, it started in uh, 69 building up systems, um, even de trying to deal with the, uh, the fusing issue. By 1970, uh, though the active optical target detection was complete and being retrofitted into the standard arm missiles. And of course, the current technology, the, the HARM program still utilizes an active optical altimeter fuse along with the contact fuse. And so I can't really say that there's a direct connection between those technology developments, but uh, my hunch is if you ask subcontractors, they would say, oh no, we're, we're all way past the Navy technology. But my hunch is that there really is a, a good solid connection there. Um, this example, I think, followed most of our topics. Um, the next chart actually did list uh, sort of a summary of the other 
stories. I've been talking about this one and alluded to the 9L. The 9L is where Roy actually succeeded in transitioning the, his uh, laser um, fuse into Sidewinder. Uh, actually, the first, uh, it was the DSU-10 that went into standard ARM, but I think it was actually uh, the D version of standard ARM that officially captured the uh, AOTD. These other topics have a somewhat similar nature in the key ingredients. That is, um, they, they did a, address a high priority need, uh, which is a clue for some of the S&T folks, you know, that it's never too early to know how your technology is going to be applied. Guessing which system is going to use it is almost impossible. <laughs> you know, you're probably going to be wrong. You can, you can say that we're going to look at this technology and we're going to develop the models and it's all going to be geared to Sidewinder when, in fact, some other system will come along and say, gosh, we need this, you know, and, and it's that timing that is very hard to predict, but also the application. The point is, I guess, that you need to pick out be knowledgeable where the capability needs are and uh, make sure that your technologies are working toward that, that goal and let, let chance dictate where it actually transitions. This example is one that other people uh, might have used for other systems that, it, it, with regard to quick reaction. Um, you can look at this story uh, with regard to the standard arm and say, Holy cow, those guys at Channel Lake turned around, uh, solved a problem within 18 months, and got things into production that kept this program going. How great. It was great. But you have to remember that that did take about 10 years, a little something short of 10 years, for that technology both to mature to a point where it could be used and then be demonstrated all under um, what I'd be considering exploratory or advanced development kind of demonstrations. So if you take that out, then yeah, we got a real quick reaction response to a fleet need. Uh, the point that I might make is that um, in all of these cases, essentially, it takes longer to go from a TRL. Is everybody familiar with a, a TRL uh, uh, measurement? That's a technology readiness level. And there's a scale of like one through nine of how mature the technology is. And if you can show feasibility that the basic idea is, is going to work, um, the technology might work for this application, if that you call that a three, uh, it takes longer to go from three to six than it does, which is ready for production, than it does actually production engineering and into the system. Uh, so if you're there, I, I know a lot of people are talking about reducing the timeline um, for transitions or for actual for system development from milestone A, which corresponds roughly to concept feasibility, to milestone C, which is the production, insertion into production. Uh, statistics, they repeat. I'm just repeating what Captain Nash said is 11 and a half years on average to go from A to C, um, most of my examples would verify that for our systems. I was a little surprised. Um, but it does take longer to actually take your technology into a demonstration, demonstrable form than it does to go from that point into production. So if you're going to cut that timeline down, you got to find some way to cut down the technology development part. and I. I'm not optimistic about that. The other thing I would say is um, I'm, I'm not sure about the wisdom of signing up for a transition too early. I think um, it's really high risk until you've actually demonstrated uh, to at least a level five. Um, that is a prototype demonstration in fairly real, realistic environment. Um, if you haven't done that, um, it's probably too early to really commit to a particular application, a particular timeline for insertion into a system. Um, but that just comes from 
20 years of technology planning, I'm, I, I understand the pressures on O&R that would uh, try to get transition agreements earlier, but I think it's doomed to <laughs> myself. Um, so I was going to say um, the timeline, um, the acquisition opportunities. I, I think the last comment I might make is that how you organize both your work units uh, and and your groups makes a difference. Uh, if you if I look back at what worked, you know, in times, and that's that's what all of the, these transition stories are trying to do is go back and find out what worked best and try to match that and and adapt. When I look at that, uh, I see organization structures that, um, number one, have uh, corporate research front and center. Uh, number two, it has a technology area kind of orientation as we do today uh, with regard to, say, energetics or, or propulsion or sensors and signal process, something of that nature. But within that grouping, they will have here is the advanced technology group working their kinds of issues, and here is the, I'll say, engineering support, or, or not support, the engineering development kind of group. I know uh, in years past I used to be a, a strong, uh, I, I would complain a lot to our management saying that I can't get the 6-2 program into engineering development because, I mean, the guys aren't in the same group. Well. I think there's wisdom in that. The, the, the s and folks need a different peer group. They have different requirements for satisfaction of their, uh, what they need to do with technology. And I would probably now say that was wise to have within the same, I'll say department structure, but in separate groups, keep your technology folks separate. Um, probably not going to happen. If I look at today's or chart, it's more like a work breakdown structure, like you would build airplanes or something. And, and I, I don't think that's as effective if transition of development and transition of technology is one of your goals. And for those of us who work in that business, that's how we satisfy our cultural goal of support to the warfighter, getting our work into the fleet. If you have any questions or comments, uh, corrections, uh, I'm certainly willing to take all, any or all of those. I'll lay out the, the pictures in case you're interested in looking. I have a question. Um, given the same circumstances today as you did back then with the technology leading off 10 years before, do you think you could have something, an 18 month turnaround going into production like you guys <coughs> did back then? Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, one of these stories, I'm sorry, I'm sitting sort of in front of would be referring to the Hellfire thermobaric warhead, which was touted by the Secretary of Defense, no less, as being a ver an excellent quick reaction program. And in something very similar, I would say in two years, the guys up at the Hill um, were able to complete an engineering design for a warhead that would fit right into Hellfire and give it a brand new capability, which was a requirement by the Marine Corps. Really, a couple of years. But just like our example here, the same thing is true. For eight years preceding, we were working on what was called solid FE, a replacement for the earlier Vietnam era uh, FE weapon uh, that could actually be carried aboard ship now. And so that would be a solid uh, explosive uh, ingredients. And so our acquisition opportunity died. I mean, we, we completed all that work, documented all the results, had the data for design, and put it on the shelf because the Navy decided not to replace the Fay weapon. Here, a couple years later, they say, well, I don't need it for a Fay weapon, but I need, really need something for these confined space targets for Hellfire. And that's how the warf warhead folks could pull together their design and insert it. So, yeah, I think that method works, but you got what you need is a fairly full technology pipeline. Mm -hmm. 
you need ideas being developed, technologies being tracked, evaluated. Uh, and without that, then, of course, I think these quick reaction activities are doomed. Another good example that a lot of technology work was done in kind of like uh, thrust spectrum control, thinking we need something like the Agile missile to be able to conduct air to air combat by being able to shoot the guy behind us over our shoulder. Well, Agile was a big program here at Channel 8, it never went anywhere. But if you look at the uh, technology that's on the Tomahawk booster, mm -hmm. that's what's in there. And nobody expected that's where it would end up. 20 years of development of the technology to build those fins that could stand the high temperatures of that hot rocket exhaust and steer the missile without wings on the outside ended up in a submarine-launched missile, of all things, that's right. which we didn't expect to happen. I think that is almost the rule of our stories here. The technology was really geared to something else when it was studied and developed, um, and opportunity presented itself later on that you would not have predicted. Yes? I'd like to comment on the long lead time between use, uh, a new technology that's starting as a laboratory toy or curiosity and the time it's brought into uh, feasibility studies that it can actually be used for something. Now, our, having been in the research department for many years, our frustration was getting the 6.1 funding because we had the visions of what were going to, was going to be needed, and yet we couldn't convince anybody to let us work on the uh, design and uh, creation of these things that didn't happen to be in somebody else's goodie box. Do you have any comments on whether that's any better now or what gets done about it? I, I would not say it's any better. Um, I think that uh, the most stable part of the Office of Naval Research, in my opinion, it has been the 6-1 area. That doesn't necessarily mean it's good, <laughs> but it is at least more stable than, say, the next level in, in uh, exploratory advanced development. Um, and I, I am not optimistic that that is going to get better. Perhaps, I don't know what I'm talking about when I say center of excellence and uh, new BRAC-oriented responsibilities. Um, I think uh, a f an organization that is focused on its goals, and if that is a key element of an organization's goals, you might bring that uh, forward in the discussions. Uh, but uh, with regard to the uh, management, current management, and I, I don't see that trend changing. Because much of the technology that's now in these goodies is, was developed many years ago, and there's a lot more and better stuff that's out now that isn't getting uh, massaged and made into a form that can be used. That's, that's a sad truth. Yes, I agree with that. I think a lot of the technology right now, there, there are lots of money out there that they want the technology to be identified by the warfighters, by the users, I said this is what we need. If you can show that your technology solves them with those needs, yeah, you got a chance of getting them funded. But if you don't have something, if you've got something you just think is a great idea, probably got a better chance of getting money from in-house to do something with it. Because if there's nothing identified and an end, end place for it, it doesn't stand much chance. But yes. if it does, uh, yeah, I would I would say I'm actually sympathetic with the idea, as I mentioned, of of having fairly early into the development process an idea of how this is going to be used. And certainly, if you can address the one of the higher priority needs, I think it's contingent on the management to really be knowledgeable of what those needs are. They come out palm years uh, at least, and updated um, annually. Uh, and people who have the responsibility of, of informing their technologists, research folks, uh, ought to be knowledgeable of those things and helping the investigators find those connections. Um, can't do it too early, in my opinion. 
Sir. A question about uh, Chinese friends. This is, they don't develop things from scratch. They steal them and then reverse engineer them. Going down that path, how long do you think it takes them to build a modern system? So the back engineering research that they want. Um, I don't. I really don't know. I think we have documented uh, cases in the Sidewinder uh, from from the Wolf Retag times uh, as to how quickly the Soviets could do it. Um, and I would think that if anything, the Chinese will be faster. I mean, uh, the technologies can can help you do those things faster now. Um, but we're not going from 12 tubes to six tubes, you know, and like my example would would mean so i i am i have no current information on that does anybody else you know any any uh, estimates i can remember back in, in the early 80s we got a, a copy of a russian optical fuse oh and it, it didn't have the light emitting diodes in it, side of it, so it had a flash tube yeah as the source of light and we primitive this technology was until one of the oil sports in the room pointed out that this fuse was about a 20 year old design and had been in production at the time we were inventing the light and then he died. Ah, yeah. And then suddenly there was silence in the room. <laughs> mm -hmm. The Russians weren't far behind at all. In fact, they might have been ahead of us in terms of technology. They weren't using solid state. I did not comment on it, but some of the, th the uh, information I found from Ray Nichols' uh, reports um, that he sent into NAVAIR did, in fact, the, the earliest models, laboratory models, used a flash lamp as a source because he couldn't find enough power in the semiconductors yet either. Xenon flash lamp. Right, that's right. The um, altimeter fuse that you talked about, um, I'm just kind of curious, does that have any relationship to the, let's say, the depth charge or the anti-swimmer fusing that they are counting now? Mm, no, I don't think so. This, the altimeter fuse uh, supported the mode of attack for all of the defensive pressure. The, the tactics that were developed for Shrike was actually to lob the missile up, not only for extending its range, but to actually have it come in at the right altitude, attitude. And uh, lethality says that you have to fire at a particular height for a particular type of target. And so that's all that, that function was, that altimeter function was. Uh, and uh, a backup was the contact fuse. The anti-swimmer grenade thing grew out of something we were doing for uh, adapting a bomb for a shallow water submarine. All of these are examples of having a relatively robust and full technology pipeline. You know, that, and if we have suffered anything over the last 10 years that is disastrous to that, it is the loss of a coordinated 6-2 program. Um, it's, it's suffered, I mean, there, there, are, there are pockets of healthy 6-2, that's, that's for sure. And, but, uh, but what I mean, a, a systematic kind of uh, ability to uh, have technologies work together for systematic problems is not nearly as strong. And that's what I worry about. I mean, we're going to have to populate for good health in meeting the applications as they come about. Uh, I think we're going to have to try to find some way to fill up those pipelines again. Talk a little about you know, transitioning, having a large tech base from which to draw from the transition things. Do um, you want to comment on the operators and the forefighters' role in that? Because, you know, I've 
there's some experiences now that are going on that you know, that's kind of a champion that's, you know, you need a form that's really good. But I know in the old, you know, prior, that was the thing with the board that you were trying to work to. Do you want to comment on that? Operator's role versus tech-based role? And well, Yes, uh, I, I start out with the premise that, that you are addressing a priority need with your technology development. And uh, I don't know at what TRL you need to do that, but uh, so I, I would say that it always has been, at least in my knowledge, uh, very important to know what the warfighter need is. And fortunately, we have had a fairly consistent in our area, air weapons area, we've had a fairly consistent dialogue over the years with the folks in the Pentagon, the OPNAV types, as well as the folks at Fallon. I was kind of glad to see over the years they've actually gotten more responsibility um, and are excellent communicators as to what the capability needs should be uh, in the upcoming POM. Now that doesn't tell you, you know, that you're working on the right problem eight years from now when you actually get your technology ready for demonstration, but it tells you that what direction you need to be going. And that, and that when, I, when I made the point that I think branch heads and such have a responsibility to their technologists to really know what those capability gaps are from year to year, what's changing. Um, the other access point that we have, of course, is the uh, Advanced Technology Review Board, which I understand is being reformulated a little bit, but hopefully uh, the nature of the dialogue, um, that would be more with the acquisition community than with the warfighters. But the warfighters, I believe, come through the Pentagon for us. And uh, as long as there was a, what was your organization, Frank, when you uh, toured there? Um, the resource sponsor for the science and technology program still was in the Pentagon and they were the ones who actually put together the s and needs that ONR was supposed to be responding to. And I think the elements of that information are still there. So. Yeah, a document at that time called the Science and Technology Planning Guidance. And we would go around to the different op map codes and basically just sit down and talk to them and ask them what their needs were. The SEALs would say, we want those kind of things that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger used in his movies. <laughs> it's really fast and have a lot of firepower, but we kind of distill that into a document, and uh, that would go to O&R for, for guidance. Now that's we also of have science advisors. Uh, Larry Fleet Command has a science advisor whose job is to assess what their, uh, uh, what their needs are and how can technology um, you know, address those. Uh, they had a pretty good process. I've been on a soapbox on this for a while, but they used to put out documents on those command capability initiatives that they stopped doing. They still put out an integrated priority list for each uh, COCOM that says what their, what their needs are. And it's kind of, you know, we can look at those and see how can we apply technology to those, to those needs. Now, that certainly doesn't preclude, should not preclude, uh, direct contact with warfighters uh, in order to formulate and better understand what the capability needs are. Um, but I would still put that probably to the first line supervisor to really know uh, how to make those contacts for the investigators. Do you think that? Well, it, I've just noticed, you know, I've been 27, 28 years, that we used to rely a lot more on, you know, the OAGs and the requirements. But I, I know some of the last 10 years or so have shifted going directly from being pulled with the warfighter with actually, you know, can you fix this and do that? And, and maybe that's just unusual, but I just looking, you know, what, what your experience is Well, since all my experience is probably about 10 years old, <laughs> but I, for one, did brief uh, OAG uh, at every opportunity. I attended, That's that I was referring to the Fallon kind of meetings, um, and so I think for the, the technology planners and maybe the supervisors of the technical folks, um, those are the right people to be making those kind of contacts. I think the individual researchers or, or investigators um, need access to that kind of information where it's relevant to them and then they can fly that way. I, I don't know that I would send too many of those folks directly to the OAGA though. I, th I think there's a... Well, they limit the 
Yeah. One problem you have is you, know, you, you really want to get the fleet stage, but they're focused on today's problem and what they need right now. And as Tom pointed out, it takes uh, many years for technology to get to the point where it's uh, going to be applied. So we kind of have to kind of guess what the needs are going to be there. They've got things like the strategic study group and the Naval War College. There's a lot of people putting a lot of thought into it. I mean, Jim and that gang, you know, what's the future going to, to look like? So. If you don't mind, one final. Oh, go ahead, Lois. Is there an example of a technology that just did not have that steady development and then missed a, a real opportunity for a transition? You know, that's that's the flip side of the analysis that I should have been doing. <laughs> How many uh, opportunities we missed is something that I have not pursued. I mean, I, I don't have that documented. Um, probably because ONR wouldn't give me more money for opportunities. <laughs> Frank's got one that he ran Where's that ramjet? Oh yeah, no, there's there's an an opportunity. Yeah, that's an opportunity that we may have missed. You know, we never put Gimlet in production. We built it all the way up to the prototype test stage. And then decided no, we had sidewind and we didn't want to do it. Fiber optic guidance. Yeah, I, well, well, there are many. Let me let me tell you that a transition to the fleet system is an extraordinary event. I mean, these are the products of decades of work, you know. And I can come up with six or eight or something very explicitly. I can also give you another six or eight that we probably can't talk about yet. Uh, but still, it is a, a, an extraordinary event to be able to track all the connections, as I tried to do for this story, um, and what was working and what, what wasn't. Um, number one, there's not a lot of consensus on current programs um, as, to, <laughs> as to what kind of problem you're in. Um, but yeah, if I, if I could get 15 to 20 percent of the program, I think, is actually an optimistic goal of uh, topics that one might be able to get to the very latest stages. There are so many vetoes in, in the acquisition process uh, that are completely unrelated to the status of the technology that uh, really hurts. Uh, if you're dealing with a program that is international in one nature, I mean, that, that's really tough. Um, we think the Air Force is tough, but, and they are. I mean, they, they, they will try not to use Navy technology, it seems, but that's just a paranoid that I still have. Uh, but there are many ways that you can fail that process, and it has nothing, no reflection on the status or the quality of the technology, which is the only thing that you can really so I think is that the, uh, the businesses out there, the Raytheons and, and whoever else in the world, have their technology. They want to sell that. But why would they want to put some new technology in that the Navy says is the best thing since sliced bread when they're already slicing bread just fine? Mm -hmm. And they know what their profit is on it. Mm -hmm. By that same token, a lot of new technology gets put in because they're selling it for old technology to do the job just as well or even mm. cheaper. Mm. So new technology does get developed that way. All of those are, are perfectly valid um, problems, obstacles that one has to occur or overcome. And I'm not sure that any detail of planning or coordination or demonstration would solve most of those. I mean, that, that just a fact of life. When when the timing and the situations do line up well, uh, then our technology has competed very well and, and we can make cases like this. I was going to tell you that this is documented finally in a recoverable fashion in a technical publication if anybody's interested. And thank you, Jane, for your help in putting that together. Well, you get a lot of credit for it and I was hoping you would definitely mention it. That's a, that's a good historical document. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. Tom, thank you very much. I have a certificate for you. Oh, thank you. And one of our highly sought after full size posters. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's well worth doing. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys.